السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الحمد لله الصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين Welcome everybody My name is Bilal Abdul Kareem and this is Face the Truth Today we have a very special guest and um, I'm very happy that she's here in northern Syria uh, She is originally from the United Kingdom No, I am not in the United Kingdom right now She is here in northern Syria She is a journalist and an accomplished author and she's come here on a fact-finding mission and her name without any further ado I'm pretty sure you probably know who she is by now and she is Yvonne Ridley and uh, her history is well known and I'd like to say to you greetings first of all here welcome to northern Syria and assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh wa alaikum salam rahmatullahi wa barakatuh as well uh, Bilal it's um it, it's great to see you, great to, uh, to be here uh, with OGN and um, I'm, you know, looking forward to this interview with some trepidation because I know that uh, you'll probably sneak in something that will put me on the spot, but uh, dare I say fire away? <laughs> well, um, if I can, uh, if, if, uh, first of all, I just want to tell you, I'm so happy that you are here. And let's just start with a question that I'm sure is on a lot of people's minds. Why are you in Syria? Because I want to find out the truth. Um, people give black and white narratives on Syria. Assad is a good guy, everybody else is a terrorist. Uh, the other side will say we're freedom fighters, we're in a revolution, we want to get rid of this tyrant. Uh, Yet yeah, today we got caught up in a little bit of crossfire, mortar bombing, and it turns out it's Muslim groups on Muslim groups. Uh, the only thing that everybody seems to be able to agree on here is that uh, nobody likes ISIS. And uh, so it's not a one dimensional or a black and white argument. The best way of finding out about what is happening in Syria is to actually come here and uh, speak to people on the ground. And, uh, you know, that's one of the reasons that I'm here to learn about what is happening. We have various academics and think tanks who say, oh, we listen to chatter, we listen to Al-Qaeda, we listen to ISIS, we can tell you this, and they get paid fortunes to sit in TV studios in London to uh, talk about the situation. They've never seen an angry man in their life. Uh, and basically, uh, they are, um, even with the best of intentions, they're not giving a true account of what is happening here. Of course, you know the situation here. There are uh, 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 kidnappings, um, assassinations. You can listen into the, in, in the background. I'm not sure if the microphone is able to pick that up, but you can hear firing um, in the background. Uh, surely you must have had some concern for your own safety. How did your desire to want to see what's happening here supersede that self-preservation? Well, I wouldn't uh, be reckless with my life. Um, you know, I can't tell a story if I'm dead. So, uh, you know, I, I wanted to be satisfied that there would be some degree of security. Um, and also, uh, you know, I uh, fear no one but Allah. And uh, if my day is today or tomorrow, it wouldn't matter whether I'm sitting in this uh, dramatic rune, Roman rune, or whether I, I'm sitting um, on the sofa at home. You know, if today or tomorrow is, is the day when I'm going to be uh, peeling off this mortal coil, it doesn't matter where I am, it's going to happen. Now, let's go back to a point that, uh, that you made mention of. You wanted to see the situation here firsthand. Do you think the fact that you are Muslim would, um, would taint the perception that people have of what you see here? That dynamic, I don't think we could overlook. 
Well, the reality is, uh, if I say something that pleases somebody, they'll say, oh yes, she's telling the truth. If I say something, even if it is truthful, uh, that displeases somebody, they'll say, oh, she's uh, brainwashed, she's Al-Qaeda, she's ISIS. I mean, let's face it, um, anyone sitting uh, in a seat of power in Damascus is going to, if they watch this, is going to decry us and try and uh, undermine and criticize us. All I can say is um, I can only tell the truth as I see it, you know. I'm being shown a slice of Syria, not the whole picture, but I'm seeing a damn sight lot more down here on the ground than somebody sitting in a university um, monitoring chatter on the internet. Now, you've, you've, been you've been moving around a little bit here and you started to get to know some of the people um, that are here, people who are doing different projects and things of this nature. Um, what were your expectations before you came here? Was it met? Um, was it a bit underwhelming, overwhelming? Where, where do you fit in there? Um, whatever preconceptions I had, you know, I can screw them up and throw them away. Because uh, what I've found already is something that I certainly was not expecting to see. And uh, at the, the moment, you know, I'm um, under the umbrella of uh, ICRA, a charity which puts education first. And what has overwhelmed me is the um, very active role that women are playing uh, in, this, uh, in this charity, the input they're having, the presence they're having, and, you know, I expected to be walking into quite a macho um, arena uh, with armed guards everywhere and uh, men covering their faces with scarves and, and uh, military checkpoints or militia checkpoints. And instead, what I've found is a community of foreigners or immigrants uh, who are working alongside with the Syrians and wanting to build a better life not only for themselves but for the Syrians and some of the stories I've heard um, have, have been amusing in some ways because you know there's supposedly a migrant crisis in Britain uh, with you know what are these migrants predominantly Syrians escaping bombs what are what are these migrants doing in uh, in Britain they've got no place here and yet um, I heard that when the foreigners rocked up with their wives in northern Syria. Some of the, the Syrians on the ground were saying, what are these foreigners, what are these migrants doing here? We've got no business with them. Um, while Britain is still trying to adapt and be more enlightened about its approach uh, dealing with migrants, what I've found here is that um, the foreigners or the migrants have actually come uh, with a very successful charm offensive, uh, which is we want to work with you, we want to help you, we want to rebuild Syria, we want to make it a better place. And, uh, and they've won the trust of the Syrians on the ground. When you're looking at the way that the news media and Western governments in general like to paint everybody with one brush because it makes it easy just to put everybody into one basket. Now, of course, there's no way that you could speak on any individual basis or individual cases, but do you think that that's a fair assessment wherein anyone who's come to Syria who is a foreigner 
who may or may not have been fighting at some point, um, is looked at as a terrorist and is treated like that. Do you, do you, now that you've come and you've seen some things, what's your take on that? You know, I've, I've met uh, Syrian mothers. Um, I mean, if, if I can just say today, I've spent the day uh, looking at one of Syria's best performing schools for um, eight to 15 year olds. And the academic curriculum uh, is on a par with, um, with any uh, school in, in Britain. Uh, the performance, the exam results, uh, puts it on a par uh, above the, the schools in Syria today. And from being viewed with great suspicion by parents when the school first opened uh, five years ago, it's now the school that we want our children to go to. And uh, I went around and it, it's an amazing school. It's, um, it's got local Syrian children, low, um, refugee Syrian children from Homs, Hama, uh, Damascus, all over Syria. Uh, it has uh, foreign children uh, from Kazakhstan, Russia, uh, Britain, South Africa, yeah. you name a country, you know, it, it's, it's more or less represented in this, uh, in this school. And there's also a section of orphans and really poor children. So you've got a mixture of classes. You've, um, as in the class system, working class, uh, professional class, middle class uh, children uh, studying alongside uh, children of uh, every shade and, and uh, background um, from, you know, the Muslim world as well as from the West. It's incredible. And uh, those children we, we know children aren't born with hate. They're not born racist or Islamophobes. And, and you know, these children are working side by side. They don't differentiate each other by skin color or geographic area or status, you know, whether they're from a wealthy background or refugee children. And they all mix in together and the results are quite stunning. And I, I spoke to, to one teacher, the teaching staff reflects the, the school. Um, you know, there are Syrian teachers uh, alongside foreign teachers uh, in equal proportions. And uh, what I loved, one teacher told me that academically, um, we don't leave anyone behind. Mm -hmm. You know, so even the slowest learner is helped and because the classroom sizes are quite um, small, the ratio of teachers to pupils is, is better than anything in, in the West. Uh, when they say they don't leave anybody behind, it's because they can dedicate a lot of time to those, uh, to each individual child's needs. Now, the uh, administration, or I guess we should say, uh, the, the heads of the school are, uh, where are they from? Uh, Syria. And, and uh, the, the overall head uh, is from Britain. Uh, some of the senior teachers are British. And, you know, viewers are going to be going, really? Really? Uh, how, how did they get over here? Mm -hmm. The sad thing is, because um, officials from Britain haven't got off their backsides and come here like I have, and I'm not criticising, you know, not everybody wants to risk it in a war zone, mm -hmm. but because they're, they're uh, from afar, um, these teachers, these professionals, dedicated professionals, uh, have been dismissed as uh, terrorists or terrorist apologists 
or supporters and uh, it, it's quite shocking, really uh, shocking and um, it's an outrage actually because you know the teachers, um, most adults join this profession because they want to help children, they want to help the next generation grow and develop and these teachers here are absolutely no different. Well, the challenges are more so. Um, in, in the West, we may be accustomed that uh, school will be called off for the day because of uh, inclement weather, uh, snowstorm, but today was a bit different. It well, got called off because? A mortar landed in, in the, uh, the, the middle ground of the school. Um, and uh, it was uh, sad, the, the reaction from the children, because some of these children come from Aleppo, which was continually bombarded for weeks and weeks, and they hear the sound of a mortar explode so close to them, just a few yards away, and it triggers horrific memories of being bombed by Assad's forces, by the Russians, and they think, is this the start? Is this another bombardment? And you can see the fear. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it, was, um, it was a real shock to me because I was sitting talking with the teachers and had completely forgot I was in a war zone. I was in a school and, and we were talking about performance indicators, curriculum, uh, language development and you know it's almost normal mm -hmm. a normal situation I'm reporting on a normal school and then and then suddenly bang mm -hmm. and um, you're propelled back into the reality of this is a war zone which actually makes those teachers even more heroic uh, but, but some people would say that, that they're not heroic. They would say that uh, the, the people who put the school together, are they're not heroes. Um, that uh, uh, some of the people that you've met on this trip have lost their, um, their British nationality, their citizenship, their passport, their right to travel on a British uh, travel document. Um, do you think that perhaps the British government should do more to look into individual cases as opposed to perhaps, perhaps making enemies where they don't have them? Absolutely. I mean, the the British government is in turmoil at the moment uh, because of the immigrant problem. Here is a community of Brits living and working in northern Syria alongside Syrians, all of them working together to try and bring some sort of normalcy into uh, northern Syria. And the best way you do it is by education and educating the next generation. I met uh, families that would have left this area, that would have smuggled themselves over the border into Turkey, probably paid some shady people to go further on and ended up in Europe or in, in Britain, um, saying, you know, we're here, we've, we've escaped this area. Instead, this community uh, that's here has actually persuaded uh, families to stay, teachers to stay, uh, parents are seeing their children go to school and not just get an education but get a very high standard of education and really the British government should be looking at this and thinking how can we support these people? How can we give them better facilities? How can we encourage them? Because uh, they, their, their very existence here is so reassuring for local Syrians that, uh, that they're happy now, not happy with the conditions, but happy now to stay and to try and, and build a future rather than risk, you know, this hazardous journey overseas and treacherous uh, 
ways to get to Europe? For the most part, a choice has been given uh, by Western governments, not just the British government. But speaking specifically about the British government, it's an unspoken choice. You can help the Syrian people, in which case you will have to be forced to leave the United Kingdom and never being allowed to return. Or you can simply watch it happen on TV and you can maintain your British nationality, your citizenship and such like that. In reality, in reality, that's the choice that a lot of these families have been given. And that also means that your children will be virtually stateless. Do you think that's a fair choice that these young people should be given? Well, it's not a choice, is it? Anyone uh, with a conscience who watches the images of what's happening in Syria and who thinks I can maybe be part of the solution rather than the problem uh, and I can help these people, I have skills, I've got engineering skills, I've got teaching skills, I've got medical skills, uh, I work for a charity, I'm going to go out there and help these people um, and, and uh, you know, that choice has been taken away from them because uh, what they, they, they've had to sacrifice their nationalities. I've spoken to, um, to one woman from South Africa. Her children have no status at all. Uh, they have no nationality. And anybody who's stateless will tell you, without an identity card, without a passport, uh, you can't travel, you, it, it's difficult to get education, it's difficult to get medical help. You know, without uh, a passport or an identity, it's difficult to get anything. And. Uh, I, I think that uh, the British government um, has just had this knee-jerk reaction and has almost panicked and you know what I'd say is for God's sake uh, we're British where's your stiff upper lip you know get a get a spine and start and, and look at this situation not everybody who comes to Syria is a terrorist uh, the, the groups of, of people that I've met, um, for instance, you know, when we've discussed ISIS and ISIS did have a, a presence here, they tried to make inroads here and uh, people were horrified, um, it, you know, including the foreigners. And, you know, they, they were appalled at the very thought that ISIS could get a foothold in this part of Syria and uh, thankfully they were driven out um, by different militias. What do you see for um, British nationals that are here in the days coming ahead? Uh, because in a war zone, of course, things can go badly very quickly. Um, there may come a time where uh, some of them may have to leave or they may be able to uh, s settle here and just g go on with life as normal. What would you like to see regarding them in general? What do you think that, uh, that the British government should be doing? Well, there's a very big issue at the moment about the misuse of, um, of uh, overseas spending uh, in uh, poverty-stricken areas. And uh, there's a, a scandal growing saying that taxpayers' money is being given to governments and large organizations that uh, some are corrupt. Uh, the money is not going to the place where it should be going. Um, I've seen uh, ICRA and, and other groups on the ground in Syria and uh, the, the British government uh, should throw some money this way and create more schools of this uh, high standard that uh, 
that, that uh, is, is not happening elsewhere in Syria. What surprised me coming here, you know, seeing all the refugee camps, with the exception of the internationally uh, known IHH, the Turkish charity, um, I don't see any major logos here of, uh, of the, the big British charities. I don't see any presence on the ground. Um, I just see individual and, and small collectives making an effort to improve people's lives. And they tell me that it's very difficult to operate because people in Britain and, and elsewhere are afraid to send money mm -hmm. over here uh, because they could be accused in Britain of um, giving material support to terrorists, which could mean anything. I mean, I, I've met um, a couple of people who have had their passports removed and I've sat down, I've spoken with them, I've been quite frank with them about their activities here and, uh, you know, if they are terrorists, then I'm going to have problems going back to Britain mm -hmm. after coming out here. But now, you've seen them, you've seen how they talk, you see how they think, um, in, in the general sense, of course. Uh, do you feel in your heart, now you were born and raised in the United Kingdom, um, nobody has the desire, and I think I'm, I'm speaking for you now, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but nobody ha has the desire to see uh, British blood flowing in the streets, um, bombed out uh, uh, British uh, institutions and killing British people in the streets in the name of any religion. Mm -hmm. So I would ask you, in the general sense of these uh, young men and women that you met, do you see them in general as a threat to British society? Absolutely no threat at all. Um, none at all. Uh, some of them have absolutely no desire to go back to Britain at all. Fair enough, that's their choice. Uh, some of them have family that they would like to visit now and again. Uh, some of them might eventually one day want to return to Britain. And if they are allowed to, um, I would imagine that they would want to contribute very much to their communities in Britain just in the same way as they are um, contributing to the communities here. Um, the initiatives that I've seen uh, are really uh, uh, inspirational. And what I love about, about them is the prominent role and influential role of women. Uh, now then some viewers might be saying, oh, you know, uh, these are religious fanatics and, and uh, you know, I bet they're teaching Islam in those schools. Um, yes, they are teaching Islam in those schools. This is a Muslim country. You know, uh, which may <laughs> may shock some people. Shock some Sorry, people. but it is a Muslim country. Um, you know, when I went to school assembly as a kid, uh, we used to have Christian services, and and uh, because you know that's the area that that I came from. Um, so uh, there's the the first hour of every morning at school is set aside for Islamic studies um, and I'm not talking about the sort of brainwashing uh, swaying backwards and forwards, Quranic recitals, learning everything by parrot fashion. I'm talking about children learning uh, the language of the Quran but learning about its meaning, its content and it, the reality is that um, if those from ISIS had that sort of educational grounding in Islam, mm -hmm. they would never have gone to join ISIS. Mm -hmm. They would, re, you know, the, these children 
that are, are being taught uh, the Quran and, and the peaceful message of Islam, um, that's going to stay with them as they develop uh, in the in the rest of their their lives, so they're they're getting an Islamic grounding, um, an hour every morning, but the rest of the day is spent on uh, secular, I would say, um, academic uh, curriculum, uh, which is why the hours at this school are longer than any other school. In, uh, in the area um, and now as I say Syrian parents are scrambling wanting to get their children into mm -hmm. the, the school mm -hmm. because it's, it's uh, the standard of education is, uh, is so high. Do you think that in, in the uh I listen to uh, British nationals sometimes, they say, I don't want to go back to the UK. I, I, I don't want to go back there. But I want to qualify some of the statements that, that they make. They say that they don't want to go back, but just like anybody else, they would love to go to see their families or visit mm -hmm. them and so on and so forth. But the problem that they have is the fear that if and when I were to walk into Heathrow Airport, I would lose my passport. I'll be thrown in, in, in prison, and, and that will basically be the end of me. Um, a lot of them, I know them personally, I see them on a consistent basis, and I know what they do from, uh, from one day to the next. I feel, and this is myself, I think that um, it's so, it, it makes me so sad because growing up in America, we always saw America and the, the United Kingdom as these bastions of 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 of, uh, of righteousness, of, um, of 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 fairness, and democracy. We grew up with these ideals. I myself, I, I wasn't Muslim when I was growing up. Do you think that we were misled all those years? Well, you know, I love my country. Um, I well, I live in Scotland, which maybe I'm biased, but I think it's. It, it's the one of the best parts of the United Kingdom, but I love Britain and after going out into war zones or, or visiting countries where there are really tyrannical regimes in place, you know, getting uh, back to Heathrow used to be a, oh, thank goodness I'm back in Blighty, but now um, there are parts of, of my country I don't recognise. I don't recognise uh, this uh, racist, bigotry fueled Islamophobia. Uh, I don't recognise the um, abuse of uh, people's human rights. You know, Britain used to be a beacon uh, of, of human rights. Uh, I don't recognise this uh, real anathema called um, secret evidence yes that uh, not only is the accused not allowed to see but even his solicitor cannot see the secret evidence so he has no opportunity to challenge it absolutely not now up until a couple of so years ago um, you'd think secret evidence oh gosh this is mi6 mi5 top-level intelligence, um, they've somehow got some satellite information and it's really, you know, high-tech surveillance, some, there's no smoke without fire. And then uh, we find out that one individual, for instance, um, the secret evidence against him uh, was a drunken phone call to a Crime Stopper hotline an anonymous drunken phone call that was the secret evidence and that was the secret evidence and the person who made that call um, they had a prick of conscience and after a few years they confessed to this individual who's gone through all sorts of hardship virtual house arrest for two years on the run when he challenged it and contested it 
And the, this person said, I'm sorry, it was down to me. I phoned this anonymous tip-off line when I'd had a little bit too much to drink and I said that I thought that you were going for terrorist training when he was coming to Syria long before the revolution started. Uh, Syria had a great reputation for learning Arabic and he wanted to learn Arabic. And when once he had this knowledge and his lawyers challenged it, the authorities red-faced, uh, although shameless, more or less said, yes, that's the secret evidence. So we're not talk, you know, when you say secret evidence, it's sort of like, oh gosh, this is, uh, must be really hot stuff. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's not at all. Um, and, you know, British people, m my mother, she's 91, her point of reference is uh, the Second World War. And her generation, um, you know, th that, that was, and they would tell tales and stories uh, to their children and grandchildren. And it was, you know, true Brits, true grit, backbone, stiff upper lip, not running around using a drunken phone call to rob somebody of their, you know, what is this? We are not a tin pot dictatorship. And I, I really feel ashamed of some of the actions of uh, the British government. But now let's talk fighters for a second, because uh, there's another aspect to this. Um, uh, not all, I'm not just talking about British nationals, I'm talking about Americans, I'm talking about other Europeans that have come here and um, they don't have a problem to say openly, plainly and clearly that we are fighters, we fight and mm -hmm. um, we have military training and experience um, but we are very, very focused on what's going on here in Syria and they feel like they're being judged unfairly mm -hmm. um, and demonized because they do have military training, they know weapons and they know how to use them. But so does as so do soldiers in every uh, military. Mm -hmm. uh, what's your reaction uh, to that? Now, we're not talking about educators anymore. We're talking about fighters. Do you think that uh, there should be a special category for them? Particularly given, given the, the fact that the British government didn't exactly come running to save the Syrian people. No. Well, the, um, you know, playing devil's advocate, uh, there was an international brigade of 60,000 foreign fighters who went out to Spain uh, to fight against uh, Franco and the fascists in Spain. And they were all heroes. There are monuments uh, around, dotted around towns and cities in Britain uh, praising these people for their heroic stance. I have to say that there were also um, a few thousand uh, who went to fight for the fascists from Britain and America and other countries as well. And uh, that was in a climate where young people, men and women with different, uh, with high ideals, saw people in trouble and they wanted to go and help. Instinctively, if someone shouts for help, you go running. And, and that's what they did. Um, the fighters here have not been accorded the same um, respect. Uh, however, you know, uh, it's very confusing here. Uh, ISIS, uh, it, it's a dreadful organization. It's an evil, an evil organization absolutely wicked. Uh, anybody who joins ISIS, I'm sorry, I think, you know, just lock them up and, and throw away the key. Um, but uh, there are groups that uh, are being armed from the West and uh, there are uh, other groups that uh, would despise ISIS, as I say, the only thing that I've found in common uh, with all the, the different groups is that they all hate ISIS. 
uh, but there are some groups uh, that are s supposedly Al-Qaeda. Now I, I spoke to somebody earlier today and they've given me a breakdown of um, what it is to be Al-Qaeda. Is it really Al-Qaeda? Is it just a label? Is it something that uh, that's past its sell-by date? And that uh, collectively the fighters, um, you know, pose absolutely no threat beyond these borders to anyone. Uh, their mission is to uh, protect uh, free Syria, which, you know, we're in free Syrian territory at the moment, and um, to overturn. Um, or bring down the Assad regime. Now, unfortunately, all these different groups um, are not the same, which is why there's so much infighting, uh, which in itself is shameful, uh, wasting so much energy when they, you know, they should really be stepping up to the plate and, and focusing on what they came out here to do, which is to protect the Syrian people. Um, in short, Syria is a very complex issue. It cannot be treated black and white. You cannot label this group Al-Qaeda, this group uh, terrorists, this group... You, you just can't do it. And, um, and the shameful thing is that all the support networks are also being demonized as well, you know, with this one wide brush, when in fact the British government should be looking at um, the sort of initiatives that are going out here, going on here, that make Syrians want to stay in their country, want to rebuild their country, that gives them some hope that uh, there could be life beyond Assad. Mm -hmm. I mean, some of just uh, a few months ago, I interviewed Syrian women who had been in Assad's prisons. And, you know, there are still about 7,000 of these women in Assad's prisons being held without trial, without charge, uh, which is illegal in Syria as well as under international law. And uh, I can say as, as a woman, there is no way you can have Assad as part of any solution to, uh, to this problem. Do you think that the international community's forgotten these women? They've forgotten the weapons of mass destruction being used uh, uh, to drive out millions of people. Do you think they've forgotten that or they've selectively decided to forget? It's um, selective amnesia. Uh, let's remember the whole reason, according to Bush and Blair, uh, the whole reason for the invasion of Iraq was to liberate the Afghan women. I don't know how many, I think there's been four British armies that have gone in, sorry, into Afghanistan, uh, that have gone into Afghanistan to, uh, to liberate Afghan women uh, over the centuries. You know, those Afghan women should be among the most empowered women in the world today because so many uh, Western armies have gone in there to liberate them. Mm. Well, they're not. You know, there's a few green shoots of hope here and there, but it's been a disaster. Um, and and uh, Afghan women have been horribly betrayed by Western governments. Um, speaking as a woman, the men in the governments couldn't give a stuff about women. We're picked up and dropped down when it suits them. And I say the men because, you know, uh, these governments that went to war in Afghanistan, uh, in Iraq, were predominantly male-led. Um, and. Uh, this, this is why, you know, I'm, uh, I consider myself to be a feminist, which is anathema to some people, but that's, you know, I see that women are part of the solution. And uh, we should have a voice 
um, in all levels of government and you look at governments where there is a gender balance and uh, I or a you know an influential or a predominant number of, of females I don't see anybody uh, wanting to bomb or invade Finland or Norway or Sweden uh, I, I don't uh, see that at all Scotland you know where there is a gender balanced uh, cabinet of, of, of uh, government ministers um, women are part of the solution and you know, as I say that that was the first thing that surprised me when I came and, and had a look at around at all the developments that uh, ICRA are involved with and all the partnerships on the ground and everywhere you looked uh, you know the, there's uh, female influence and it is so important you know I keep saying uh, we um, are half the Ummah and we gave birth to the other half uh, so you know we we should be quite visible uh -huh. and it was uh, really encouraging to see the presence of so many women. If you could uh, speak to the people who are here, the young men and the young women that have come here, uh, not only from the United Kingdom, from, but uh, uh, other immigrants who've come here uh, uh, to help the Syrian people. If you could look at them and speak to them and say something to them, what would it be? What would it be? What would you say to them? I would line them all up and pin a medal on each and every one of them because uh, because of the sacrifices that they've made, because of the sacrifices that they're making. Uh, you know, living in a war zone, you can't guarantee the internet, you can't guarantee uh, the things that we take for granted uh, back in the UK. Um, it's a hard life out here. It's a very hard life. Um, but just because a teacher is in a classroom in uh, northern Syria, it doesn't mean to say they don't have the same dedication and the same hopes and wishes as a teacher in Birmingham or uh, Brighton or, or uh, you know, wherever. And it, it's... Uh, to these young people, I, I would just say thank you and, you know, if the government uh, just would stop and take a look uh, at the results, at the achievements, uh, they might realise that uh, this, these sort of projects could be the very answer that they're looking for that makes people think, you know what, I'm not going to risk everything to cross Europe and get into Britain or to go and, and make a home in, uh, in Germany. Um, I mean, it, 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 it was great that Angela Merkel uh, showed that compassion and she opened uh, the gates to Germany to one million um, Syrians. It, it was an amazing act of compassion. But the tragedy is there's at least 3,000 doctors there that aren't here. Yes. There are thousands of teachers there that aren't here. So um, to see this initiative, uh, and, and it's taken five years or so on the ground to take root and gain the trust of the local Syrians because, you know, they, the local Syrians said, who are these foreigners? Why should we trust them? Oh, they're wearing hijabs, they're wearing niqabs, they're religious fanatics. I'm not sending my children there. And then, of course, word of mouth, um, children are going home, learning to read and write and uh, develop skills that uh, they would if they were in a normal environment and suddenly parents are realizing uh, it's, it's not all religion, it's not all, you know, 
Uh, and now, as, as I say, the, the school in, in, in some ways, I fear, could become a victim of its own success because so many parents mm -hmm. want to put their children into this school and of course the school has a very strict policy on teacher-student ratios which is why they've got such a, a high standard. If you could look into the camera and you could speak to the British people about the results of this trip mm -hmm. and you could say something directly to them, what would you want them to know? I would uh, just say if you can give aid uh, to ICRA and the, the charities that are supporting them, please do. I am seeing things on the ground that are making a change. I mean, the, the funny thing is, um, you know, a, some larger mainstream charities are accused of creating an aid um, reliant mentality on people so that they're constantly holding their hands out to be fed. Um, ICRA wants to put itself out of business. It wants to uh, make these people self uh, dependent and, and working for them, um, making things work for themselves uh, so that they no longer need ICRA. It, it's, it's really incredible. I'm, I know I've gone on, but I must tell you about uh, this, this woman uh, th that um, I, I went to her home yesterday. She's a widow, um, sitting at home doing nothing uh, but she has a talent she's got a skill she's a great seamstress so ikra gave her a sewing machine and she was taking uh, clothes that had been donated from overseas and she was uh, stripping them down and, and remaking them remodeling them so that they fit because we're all different shapes and sizes so that they fit uh, people and they were giving her a few pennies or I think uh, you know yeah. 25 pence mm -hmm. for, for changing an outfit so that it was customized and, and uh, tailor-made. Um, she was doing so well she was able to buy another machine or ICRA may have given her another machine. Anyway, she's ended up with three sewing machines. She's employing uh, two other women, uh, training them up. And uh, she, she's, uh, this is in the space of a year. She's tripled her workforce. She's making money. She's able to give money to, to some of her fellow Syrians to help them out and, and uh, they're investing her money to do other things and other skills. This, this woman deserves a Captain of Industry Award um, and it, it's, it's amazing. She has her dignity back. She has a reason for getting up every day. Uh, she's got her own little business. Well, it's becoming quite a large business now. And uh, th this is the sort of uh, change that, uh, that ICRA has made to somebody's life. That's just one person. Um, I could go on and on with other examples. I'm, you know, so impressed because and they don't want Syrians to be aid dependent. The Syrians don't want to be aid dependent. And uh, it, it's, um, it's wonderful to see this, uh, this partnership mm -hmm. and, and development. And uh, the head of ICRA said to me yesterday, if for some reason um, we suddenly go or we're no longer here, all the people that we've helped are able now, more or less,
to stand on their own two feet and to continue mm -hmm. um, supporting themselves and, and to continue improving their lives. All right. Well, uh, uh, your trip is uh, not quite over. There's still some more uh, uh, that you'll probably end up seeing. I hope you have a successful and a safe trip. Well, no more mortar shells, please. No more mortar shells, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Whoever, anybody who's... who's li I'm look I keep looking at the skies because um, some Russian planes were out and about mm. um, in... Uh, well, that, that, that's a reality here. Uh -huh. the, uh, the, the realities are just that the, the, the skies are full of uh, Russian, Syrian, uh, other than them, American uh, planes, and we just have to just get on with life. Um, uh, Yvonne Ridley, I'd like to thank you uh, for taking out the time to help us to understand these things, and um, we hope you have a safe trip, and we hope, inshallah, that you'll be back again. Well, let me get out first before I can come back. But yes, um, I, I hope so. And uh, certainly what I've seen here, um, I will be telling other people about because uh, people need to know uh, the good side of things that are happening in, uh, in Syria today. I was afraid I was going to come and oh we're having a terrible time and oh it's this and it's hopeless and you know the, the but there's no victimhood here and it, it's uh, it's it's been an inspiration so thank you and thank you to to all the Syrians uh, locals and and uh, those who've who've come here from um, Damascus and Homs and Hama and, and all the other areas in uh, Syria who've come to what they call free Syria. And, you know, if it was uh, a, a, a terrible place full of uh, Islamic uh, fundamentalists, um, why would they come here? Why, you know, they would just carry on over, uh, over the border. All right. Well, this has been Face the Truth. I am your host, Bilal Abdul Karim, uh, with uh, journalist and author Yvonne Ridley. Jazakum Allah khaira, and we will see you next time. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.